we can start. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, so welcome uh, to uh, today's uh, lecture. Um, I'll give you a brief introduction um, to the uh, School uh, of Materials Research, and then I, uh, I will introduce our uh, today's speaker. So um, first of all, I'll say that my name is uh, Adam Nocek, and uh, I'm one of the founding directors of the School of Materials Research. And the school is an education research collective that offers intensive study courses and seminars, special programs, research in and research initiatives that address the materialisms running through contemporary science, philosophy, art, mathematics, design, architecture, and politics. The school was founded by the Center for Philosophical Technologies at Arizona State University, the Institute of Social Sciences and Humanities in Skopje, the Department of Architecture, Theory, and Philosophy of Technics at the Technical University in Vienna, and the Critical Inquiry Lab at Design Academy Eindhoven. And the school also serves as a, as a global hub for education, research, and experimentation at the intersection of the humanities, social sciences, creative fields, and the STEM sciences. And it is my great pleasure um, today to introduce Rick Dolphine, who will be, uh, the title of his talk is Cracks, Wounds, and Becoming a Target on the Philosophy of Matter. Um, I'll just say a little bit about, uh, about Rick, um, if I can find it here. <laughs> yes. Um, uh, Rick is an associate professor in uh, media and cultural studies with an interest in transdisciplinary research at large. He is uh, he's a professor at uh, Utrecht University in the Netherlands. He has published widely on continental philosophy, especially Gilles Deleuze and Michel Serre and the contemporary arts. Um, his interests lie in posthumanism, new materialism, material culture, particularly food studies and ecology. His new monograph, The Philosophy of Matter, uh, <clears throat> a me uh, excuse me, a meditation recently appeared with Bloomsbury Academic. And he is also a PI in two international, large scale international research projects, uh, Food to Gather and Imagine. Um, and so I'm going to turn it over to Rick and please. Uh, uh, please wel welcome Rick Dolphine. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Uh, thank you uh, for having me at the Institute um, and the School for Material Research, Materialist Research. Um, I will share my screen with you. Um, if that works. No. Can you see my uh, PowerPoint slides or not? Yeah, now we can. Yeah, okay. I don't see it, but uh, trust this works then. <clears throat> okay. Um, yes. I published a book recently, uh, Philosophy of Matter. Uh, way too ambitious title but uh, <laughs> that's how it works uh, subtitle is good uh, a meditation which allows me to think about the philosophy of matter uh, so that is also what i'm going to do today uh, more or less talk about what i do in the book but i'll also include some other um, uh, projects that i've been involved in because it connects so um, I named this talk uh, Cracks, Wounds and Becoming a Target because those are, uh, I mean, of course, the book is way more intelligent than me and it talks about many different things. So I just want to highlight a few of the um, important concepts, which would be cracks, wounds and the whole idea of becoming a target. Uh, so that's what I plan to do. Uh, ideas that I will talk for uh, almost an hour and after that there will be Q&A. Um, so that's what will happen. If I can... Slide number two, as slide number two appeared in your screen, as said, I don't see it, but... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I will, uh, the book consists of four parts, and that is also what I'm uh, uh, working with in this uh, in, in this talk. 
Um, it starts uh, obviously very much from uh, uh, rethinking the whole idea of a philosophy of matter, which means uh, in my case, uh, there are many ways to, to discuss this. Uh, I was trained um, in the Netherlands actually, uh, also as a philosopher. So my starting point uh, would always be the way in which uh, Descartes and Spinoza uh, um, in the 17th century uh, had this kind of... Uh, Descartes talked about, uh, brought up a new type of philosophy, which was um, uh, difficult uh, in the beginning, but became extremely popular after that. And Spinoza responded to that with something completely different. And I think this uh, Spinozist um, starting point, for me at least, has become extremely important. And actually, I think that also for, for quite a few of the continental philosophers, uh, Spinoza has been an, uh, an important uh, figure, also because he is so eloquent in kind of um, in, in conceptualizing the alternative to uh, Cartesian uh, perspective. Um, so this is really how I want to uh, start um, my analysis, um, which means that um, I will, I mean, I'm saying a bit about Descartes and the way in which, especially the Cartesians will work with uh, Descartes' uh, idea of philosophy, which is very humanist and very much um, mm, centered on what would later become uh, the, uh, kind of a, the idea of modernism. Uh, for me, uh, Cartesianism, so the way in which others have worked with the ideas of Descartes, um, is very much dominating still uh, our current uh, life. And this is why I call a Cartesianism the presence. So the way in which anthropocentrism rules, the way in which phalagocentrism rules, and the way in which um, actually in many ways um, our um, ways of life are structured through dualisms, uh, uh, man versus animal, nature versus culture. Uh, of course, other thinkers have also played an important role in this, and uh, someone like Immanuel Kant uh, comes to mind, but uh, I think that uh, especially Descartes played a very crucial role in that and I developed that in the start of my book. As an alternative, there is Spinoza who does not take the human being as a starting point, who does not think in terms of humanisms, but who thinks in what we today would call the more than human world, which is an extremely challenging way of thinking, uh, which is why I uh, wrote the book, why I am working on these issues. Um, and uh, I use several concepts to describe this alternative form of thinking. I think the word the contemporary, which is also very popular in the arts, is interesting. Uh, talks about what happens with the times. Uh, the whole idea of the undercurrent, uh, I think, is interesting because it shows how there's so much kind of hidden underneath the current, uh, whatever that is, uh, which, um, which moves us. And I think the opposition between uh, Descartes and Spinoza uh, can be captured also in perhaps art historical uh, uh, art uh, art historical terms, where Descartes talks about the light and selective, making portraits, very much focusing on a humanist perspective, for instance, creating oppositions, whereas Spinoza is much more interested in the landscapes, being the dark and the connective. Um, so not highlighting particular matters, but really thinking about relations. So how I start my uh, philosophy of materialism is really from this Spinoza's perspective, and especially the way in which Spinoza uh, uh, keeps on stressing how thinking starts. And thinking um, for Spinoza, uh, comes in three degrees. Uh, the first kind of knowledge for Spinoza is always the imagination. 
And Spinoza says that the imagination is very dangerous and that we should be very careful with the imagination because it can go in many directions. Uh, um, whereas the second kind of knowledge, rational thought, and the third kind of knowledge, which is a kind of a divine idea, um, um, is uh, much less dangerous, of course. But still, uh, I think that and, and not many Spinozist thinkers of today would agree with me, but I think that this, especially this first kind of knowledge, the imagination, is crucial, actually also for Spinoza. Uh, is crucial in understanding how thinking works and how life uh, functions in many ways. So that is why I stress that uh, the imagination is of uh, the greatest concern. And, and the imagination is really the first kind of, I call it, have raw and untamed force that springs from a desire or appetite. Uh, appetite is a term that Spinoza uses uh, as more or less a synonym of desire. I prefer appetite. Um, Adam already mentioned that I'm also interested in food studies and in health and studies of the body. And the term appetite is interesting in that perspective because it also less affected with the history of psychoanalysis. At least for me, that's important. So um, yeah, this is what why imagination for me is really interesting because it has this 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 primary drive of appetite of going for food and moving away from poison. Um, what is also interesting about imagination is that it's so undiversified uh, in many ways, it's such a, a raw and untamed force, that philosophy and art, which are my two um, main interests, uh, are the same thing when it comes to imagination. Uh, they are real in, in, in many ways and, and disturbing um, what I work with throughout the book, the religious, humanist, and capitalist realities of the day. Uh, and these refer back to the Cartesianisms that have been installed in our world and that kind of structure our life um, up until today. So, um, yeah, the imagination. So I'm going to talk more about art later and uh, give more examples, but it's important, I think, that I say something about Spinoza uh, and about the alternative, uh, uh, the alternatives that he has to offer. I try to summarize it here a bit because this is Zoom. This is not a book, so uh, uh, it uh, asks for a different approach. So I summarized. Uh, it's a very ambitious, Rick. I summarized the more than human Spinoza in two claims, two principles. First of all, an individual is always a series of individuals at infinitum, which is a line that you can find directly in the ethics of Spinoza, uh, which is also very interesting from a contemporary uh, quantum uh, perspective, of course. In relation to that, every body for Spinoza is a relation between individuals, which I misspelled, uh, which strives to persevere in being. So a body for Spinoza is a relation between individuals which strives to persevere in being. And this perseverance is not necessarily linked to particular individuals. It's what matters is the way in which these relations are kept intact. So if individuals fall out, of the body, new um, individuals are included. Or uh, changes occur constantly for Spinoza, which is really interesting, I think, uh, and completely different from what Descartes uh, says about uh, the body or about what an individual is. So that's the first principle. Second principle: every individual is always a body and a mind. Uh, Spinoza uses some other terms for it. I'm not going to go into that. Um, but in the end, it's a body and a mind. Where, and this is always my favorite part, and in every talk I give, I come up with this uh, uh, formula, where the mind is an idea of the body while the body is the object of the mind. So the mind is an idea of the body, um, whereas uh, the body is the object of the mind. Uh, which means in uh, 
very basic terms that uh, there is in in no way any form of dualism at work. There's always this complete kind of entanglement, um, which uh, uh, a very mutual and creative entanglement uh, from which the mind and the body occur. So uh, I think this is a very interesting starting point because it immediately takes us away from a humanism. It takes us away from the whole idea of thinking in terms of opposition. It takes us away from a more um, um, a rational or uh, ideal approach um, to philosophy. Um, so um, yeah, that's really where I want to start uh, doing a philosophy of matter. And then we go to part two. So we set up this uh, Spinozist approach. Uh, I don't want to um, keep um, myself limited to, uh, of course, not to the history of philosophy, but also not to uh, um, to talking about this from a very uh, kind of an abstract perspective. Um, so what I'm doing in part two is really kind of finding a way to, to pin it down, which is also uh, what uh, I absolutely enjoy in the current trends in post-humanism and new materialism. Uh, pin it down, uh, taking up responsibility and seeing how you can work with these materialist approaches and um, uh, how it matters to us. Um, so in that way, uh, as I say here, uh, I'm echoing what Haraway says about the God trick and what uh, and about trying to avoid the God trick, what Deleuze and Guattari say about conceptual persona, and what uh, Michel Serre always does in, it, in his work, he's trying to kind of pin it down to see in what way <clears throat> this kind of philosophy is at work. And for me, it's important to, uh, to come up with some sort of a conceptual persona, uh, which of course has a lot to do with uh, uh, my type of materialism. And that is why I introduced the figure of the geometer, which is a term that, that um, I take actually from Michel Serre. When Michel Serre gave an interview after the, Gilles Deleuze passed away, uh, Serre said um, that they, uh, so Gilles Deleuze and Michel Serre were uh, friends of old age, uh, not friends of young age, which is more common, but friends of old age, meaning that throughout their lives, they kind of more and more understood uh, <clears throat> each other and they became very close friends in the end. And he said also the reason why we became friends is that gradually we both understood that we were not historians, but we were geographers as philo uh, doing philosophy as a geographer. Uh, we were geometers in that sense. Um, Serre writes a lot also about, and I, I included a picture here of the Harpadonatai, which is an Egyptian figure, an Egyptian god who kind of measures the earth. And um, after the Nile has flooded, the, the earth has to be measured again and kind of a new um, village has to be rebuilt. And um, that's why Michel Serre says the Harpadonatai is the kind of the first philosopher so much involved in earthliness and not so much a judge in earthliness and rethinking what matters to everyone. And therefore a, a very interesting figure in that sense. So I think that this, this idea of the, of the, of the geometer is, is very intriguing and very helpful um, doing a philosophy of matter, doing a geophilosophy, as uh, as Deleuze and Guattari also sometimes call it. Uh, so I take this very seriously. Um, doing a geophilosophy uh, th through the geometer then starts after the flood retreats, when the water and the land mix and become fertile, and a new time announces itself. Um, very important in this uh, second part of my book uh, is the idea of becoming a target. Uh, it has a lot to do with taking up responsibility and about uh, 
thinking the earth anew uh, when the time has come. Uh, the idea of becoming a target is uh, slightly influenced by uh, Reza Negristani, um, but um, also to Deleuze and Guattari. It's kind of a critique on um, Derrida and on actually the whole philosophy of otherness, which Deleuze, and Gu Deleuze himself also critiqued in, for instance, um, his reading of Tournier, we will come back to Tournier later in uh, Logic of Sense. Uh, so in a recent interview, I, uh, I, I summarized it and I was actually quite, quite happy with my summary because it's uh, in, in, the, in the book at least, I, I take a lot of time to do this and uh, I think this was uh, actually better. And so this is um, just me kind of summarizing the book. When Derrida speaks um, of opening oneself up to the other, uh, he says he is opening his door to invite the other in. This may seem generous, but I think it is not. I think this gesture is still, still thoroughly humanist, anthropocentric, and perhaps even paternalist. Because, uh, very much also uh, central to, uh, um, well, the whole stream of thought that Derrida is part of, uh, because it is the I who takes the initiative, who first recognizes this otherness on his conditions, and decides to take action by opening his door that was closed before. So I want to take a different perspective. And by becoming a target, I propose a very different politics. Uh, it concerns taking responsibility and a willingness to accept this radical openness, uh, to seduce the outside forces and to be ready uh, to undergo the most radical change. Being open by instead of being open to is how Negrist uh, Negristani talks about this. And I think this is actually a very uh, honest and caring type of politics. And it's not negative at all to become a target. It is affirmative. It coins a readiness to be born anew. Uh, so this is uh, why this becoming a target is so important to me. And this is also a thought that will continue throughout the book, actually. What does it mean to become a target? What does it mean as a geometer also to kind of uh, to rethink oneself first uh, radically, uh, also as a philosopher? Um, so I take a lot of... Uh, um, inspiration from um, philosophy, of course, but um, also completely in line with what Michel Serre says. Uh, Serre has often said that the whole idea that there's a difference between literature and philosophy is a recent invention of academia. <clears throat> so I, I like to work with books and actually it's not just literature it's actually all of the arts it can be included especially if we talk about imagination in a study like this so i talk about um, um literature and in the same way as i talk about philosophy so this becoming a target this readiness to be born anew i see that very much in uh uh, Michel Tournier's Friday, which is a fantastic book, uh, Robinsonade, uh, so inspired on the whole idea of Robinson going to a deserted island. Um, but Michel Tournier gives a very interesting twist to it <clears throat> and shows a very materialist twist, I would say, uh, shows this confrontation between this human Robinson and the earth and this human gradually has to get rid of all of these humanist powers that are still part of him. If you read the book, you will see that in the beginning, he's still very capitalist and he tries to kind of, <clears throat> and he's very successful actually in, in growing crops and, uh, and uh, he still be very religious and he still thinks only about himself in many ways, but gradually he, he kind of, understands that this is not the life of the islands. This is not the life that he actually should become part of. 
so that's the whole idea of becoming a target, right? That, that, that there's this moment where you all of a sudden realize that, that there's something else going on and it's bigger than me and um, I have to question myself radically. So this is what, uh, what, um, what, happen, what happens in this book, Vendredi in French, of course. Uh, to Tournier, uh, and this is the moment which I quote here in the book, where I think uh, you can kind of see it happening. <clears throat> so this is um, uh, Robinson thinking to himself and saying, "There was a radiance in the air, and in a moment of inexpressible happiness, Robinson seemed to discern another island between the one he had labored so long in solitude, a place more alive." warmer and more fraternal, which his mundane preoccupations had concealed from him. So this is exactly what, uh, what I'm interested in, of course, and that the fact that uh, through these Cartesianisms, through these uh, religious, humanist and capitalist realities of today, we kind of, we became blind to what actually goes on. Um, and we kind of move on in uh, our way of dealing with the earth and obviously we fail dramatically and we begin to understand that and uh, that is of course what uh, central to in to the second part of the book which is called this is not the earth there's actually something else going on <clears throat> so then i come to the third part of the book which um which is um Called I can see something. Um, it's actually the part where the central concepts are being introduced. Um, and the, those are the concepts. Uh, well, I, I already talked about big, the becoming a target, which was in the title. Um, but two other co concepts, the crack is very important to me and the wound. They're more or less uh, kind of, uh, they, they overlap. Um, but uh, I think they're very helpful for, for also for understanding what it means to become a target and for um, you know, rethinking the world from from the spin of his, from the Spinoza's undercurrent in that sense. Um, so the word crack, I mean, Deleuze himself talks about it too. I'm not completely following him actually. I'm uh, also very much inspired, especially in this part of the book, by uh, Haruki Murakami. And uh, so I work a lot with um, actually most of his novels. <clears throat> and I see a lot of uh, inspiring ideas in it uh, and inspiring characters. For instance, Nakata, which is one of the main characters of uh, Kafka on the Shore. Uh, Nakata is a very interesting figure who several times throughout the book Kafka on the Shore uh, all of a sudden claims there's a crack in the world, there's a crack in the world, <clears throat> which is really a central theme in the end. Uh, um, so here I try to summarize why I think that uh, Murakami, actually, I, I don't, I'm not only referring to Murakami, I see more, uh, especially in Japanese literature, which is, which should be much more interesting for, for us materialists in that sense. Uh, but here I summarize why Murakami for me became important. I, I, read, I, I, I read Murakami because all of his stories are about becoming a target and take place on the crack. <clears throat> what he shows us, uh, similar to what Kafka shows us, and I'm talking about uh, uh, Franz Kafka, uh, not so much Kafka on the shore, but it's no coincidence that the book is called like that. What he shows us is that Cracks are both on and under the surface, have no beginning or end, are thus not limited by time or space or anything else. They disturb the religious, humanist and capitalist realities of the world. They keep on playing with the present. <laughs> so I think in all these, um, um, all the stories um, of, um, Murakami, and I said, they remind me so much uh, of the work of Kafka and the work of Kafka is also kind of, is on the crack. I mean, there's, in the end, there's nothing going on. Nothing will change. It's kind of a continuous and a continuing struggle um, 
which doesn't begin and doesn't end. Um, and I see that with Murakami too. And in that sense, it, it has so much to tell about uh, what a crack is actually, or what a crack does. So I'm working with that uh, here. <clears throat> oh, I have to put this. Mm. Um, another very um, important, uh, did I use, did I skip one slide or not? No. Yes, I did. Um, yeah, cracks, um, as I just kind of try to um, uh, kind of uh, conceptualize them in the work of Murakami, um, in the end are these relations through which everything comes into existence. So it's very much a continuation, of course, of what I said earlier, and the more the Spinozist approach, the connective. Uh, I think that's really what uh, what the work of Murakami is also kind of signaling in many ways. This quote, beautiful quote from one of his uh, later books. Actually, I think Kafka on the Shore is his best one, actually, but uh, this is also good. Um, it, uh, it, it shows beautifully why I'm interested in cracks and in the end also in wounds. So here's the quote. One heart is not connected to another through harmony alone. They are instead linked deeply through their wounds. Pain linked to pain, fragility to fragility. There is no silence without a cry of grief, no forgiveness without bloodshed, no acceptance without a passage through acute loss. This is what lies at the root of true harmony. So woundedness is very much linked to the cracks, of course. In the end, it is what makes things personal and what also in relation to um, how I discussed Spinoza, uh, what in the end brings the world to ourselves and shows how the, the strict opposition kind of the also, the ignorance that you find in Cartesianism is not at work in, uh, in Spinoza's thinking. With Spinoza, there's always uh, every, every body in that sense is always a kind of an including the rest of the world, or at least partially including and kind of shifting its, its existence according to the different forms of including the world. And uh, and therefore the cracks of the world are in the end also the wounds that we are all confronted with. The best possible example, and I not so much developing this in a book, but more in another publication that uh, should be out uh, later, um, um, is, um, the, the best possible example is the the, the writing of uh, Joël Bousquet, a French uh, poet. You see him here on the on, on that part of the screen, um, in his room, laying down. Joël Bousquet um, was a soldier in the First World War, but he was shot. Uh, he was a bon vivant before that, uh, living a a very nice life, um, at least he enjoyed life in many ways, um, but he was shot, uh, and um, which meant that he was paralyzed from under his neck, actually, uh, arms still worked, um, and so he had to lay in his bed for the rest of his life, and he wrote a lot about that, about his woundedness, and how his wound actually gave him life. So Deleuze was very inspired by uh, Joël Bousquet. He talks about this in his early work and in his last work. <clears throat> and he was inspired especially by the way in which uh, Alquier, which is one of his, was one of his professors um, and a close friend actually of uh, Joël Bousquet wrote about him. But uh, what I learned from, uh, from especially Joël Bousquet is uh, that wounds are not personal. Uh, wounds never heal, they take place or they matter. 
Um, they're somewhat, uh, they're somehow kind of continuing the cracks from the outside, internalizing them. Um, in in war situation, this is obvious. This is, this is pretty obvious, of course, eh? how cracks and wounds are related. Um, so I'm summarizing here the work of Jouet Bousquet, kind of like 20 books um, in, in three of his statements. And I think this also gives us a beautiful ethics. Uh, I'm doing this only for this presentation actually, but this is kind of also what I work with in the book, uh, but in a less obvious way. So first of all, this is a quote that Deleuze uses two times actually in his work. <clears throat> Uh, the first one, my wounds existed before me, I was born to embody them. Um, which is a perfect summary of how cracks and wounds work. They do not happen to you. They're always already there. And it's, it's you who has to understand uh, how to embody them and how to live with them. And that is actually what the second... Uh, uh, quote also refers to uh, become the person of your misfortunes learn to embody their perfection and, br and brilliance um, how to live with the wound how to live according to the wound the third one is of course uh, the best in many ways and it shows also what Bouquet, Busquet himself did he became a central figure in surrealism uh, so many of the big authors, uh, the big painters, um, big performance artists came to his house in, in the south of France, um, house of his sister actually where he lived with the curtains closed, uh, always in his room surrounded by books and paintings and uh, bust of Seneca, uh, not by coincidence of course, Stoic, Stoic philosopher. Uh, but uh, Busquet is uh, the perfect example of what it means to um, live your wounds beautifully and to find a way to kind of uh, to, to set up this, this non-carnal birth, as Deleuze also calls it. Um, as said, I'm uh, working with this also in other publications. Uh, there's a book coming out hopefully finally uh, this year, <clears throat> which I edited together with Rosie, uh, Rosie Berdotti, which is uh, called The Losing Quattery and Fascism. And um, there I really talk about um, woundedness. I said it's also part of the third part of this book, but it's, it's something which keeps uh, uh, hunting me in many ways. So the question we, uh, the question I asked there, the question we asked there is how to live the anti-fascist life and endure the pain. So in many ways, um, this um, whole idea of woundedness, which is as said also central to this book, um, a best example is uh, someone like Joël Bousquet because he's not just kind of surviving the war; he's also finding a way to, um, for instance, to become best friends with Max Ernst, uh, who was actually uh, on, in the other battalion in front of him when he was shot during the First World War. Max Ernst became a famous painter, of course. Um, Joël Bousquet kept writing to him throughout his life uh, in a very generous way. And there was never a kind of... Uh, a sense of nationalism uh, or of any grief or any kind of um, any uh, pain towards fascism. Uh, I think that Busquet is the perfect example of someone who lives his wounds beautifully and who searches for ways to affirmatively engage uh, with the woundedness of the world and of himself at the same time. And this is what Ferdinand Alquier, <coughs> Ferdinand I already mentioned him, uh, one of the professors of uh, Deleuze, summarizes in his book 
also actually a really beautiful book, The Philosophy of Surrealism. Uh, it talks a lot about um, Breton and about um, all those other very famous uh, surrealists. But in the end, he returns uh, to Jouet Bousquet. Uh, in France, he's still quite well known, but in the rest of the world, for some reason, not hardly translated. Uh, but uh, Alquier um, um, nicely summarizes why Bousquet is so important. And I quote, to liberate man was always the aim of surrealism, which is also a really good way of rethinking surrealism, by the way, and uh, get rid of the, <clears throat> the Dali mysticism and uh, all that kind of crap. But um, uh, let's look again at how surrealism dealt with fascism and dealt with the war and how that happened in the paintings and in the writings. Uh, it was not just a, a Freudian thing. There was something really interesting going on in surrealism. So I said that, that to liberate man was always the aim of surrealism. It is necessary to add that with Nazism menacing in the midst of an oppressed France, the problem of man's liberation could not be resolved by automatic writing, Dadaism or whatever, but in a manner more precise, urgent and pointed by taking a political position and by a call to arms. A call to arms is not about attacking or defending. I would say a call to arms is about becoming a target, which is exactly what uh, Busquet was doing. So becoming a target, cracks, um, woundedness, this kind of embodiment, which, which I kind of work with in the, in the figure of the geometer. Um, of course, I want to kind of show how this uh, kind of materialism is already at work in the different realms of thinking of today and how this um, um, what this tells us about uh, where philosophy is heading um, so i'm um, in the fourth part of of, of my book I, I i start with michel Serre and uh, how he kind of uh, in his latest works talks a lot about what I would term woundedness, to write from one's woundedness, following the cracks. <clears throat> so I just summarize it here. So having grown up alongside the riverbeds of the Garonne, Michel Serre has to see the Garonne not simply as a river that flows, but much more as an inevitable companion, a sister, a mother, a friend that is not far from Vincennes, where he lived during the later part of his life. This is really in the books like Biogia, uh, where he uh, conceptualizes this. And the Garonne River was always flowing within him, within his body, within his thoughts, inevitably. And the slow murder of the Garonne River equals the slow murder of his thinking, inevitably also. Uh, for as always, and this is Ser, of course, playing with Descartes, when I think I become what I am thinking, uh, again, this is for me very obvious a link also to Spinoza's alternative and Spinoza's uh, more than human way of uh, rethinking materialism. So in this last part of the book, I uh, talk about the different um, uh, um, disciplines in academia, but also about the different arts in a way in which I kind of uh, see this um, Spinoza's thinking uh, at work as an undercurrent. I just picked out a, a, a few uh, themes that I think are important. <clears throat> so the geometer, um, I talk a lot from the perspective of the geometer as said, and especially in this latter part, this last part, uh, I'm constantly saying, hey, geometer, show me a new earth. So the geometer learns us how to create from one's wounds. 
uh, what does the uh, geometer say about nature? The biggest concept, um, nature is the study of the angle, which is of course already a kind of woundedness. I mean, Serre reads this in Lucretius, uh, for instance, but uh, I'm also writing about uh, the way in which um, Barat reads this uh, in contemporary feminism. So resonating with physics and with the history of science. So form, second point, form follows the crack. Playing, of course, with a very modernist idea of what um, architecture is. Form follows the crack. Uh, resonating with architectural theory. Third point, the body is that which folds, uh, which is a... Um, quote from dance. So resonating with contemporary dance and performative arts. So I try to work with this idea of woundedness, of the crack, of becoming a target and just seeing how this works in the different areas in which we are involved in. I think this, this is the part that's actually most obvious to most of you. <clears throat> um, but well, at least I hope I uh, I, I kind of start from a different perspective. So more or less to end, I'm actually very well on time. Um, I, um, I end with um, kind of, of course, moving away also, I didn't pay too much attention to that, but uh, moving away from, um, kind of a more object oriented uh, parts of philosophy, which I do not engage with uh, for the reason that the materialism that I'm talking about is something completely different. Um, so also when I talk about the arts, it is not about objects at all. Um, but anyway, in the end, I, I end up with this um, rethinking of um, materialism uh, through um, Serre, uh, Deleuze and Spinoza. Uh, for instance, working with this notion of Michel Serre, every living being is a survivor. And survivor means uh, living with one's wounds and uh, searching for ways to uh, engage with them. I am in pain and therefore in, I doubt. Again, uh, rewriting Descartes in that sense. In the conclusion, I'm saying that pain is truth. All else is subject to doubt which of course plays with the idea of subjectivity, also uh, subjectivity as a consequence of the woundedness. Uh, subjectivity as uh, something which is not uh, the starting point of everything. In other words, geophilosophy starts at the margins of the presence where the flood retreats, the water and the land mix and become fertile and a new time announces itself. <clears throat> of course, I have to end with the geometer. I start from geo philosophy, from rethinking the earth, and that is um, how I uh, need to end uh, in many ways. So I'm well on time, uh, I think. Thank you for your attention. Yeah. Thank you so much, Rick. That was, uh, and, and thank you for walking us through this beautiful book and beautiful project that's going to. Uh, I'm sure generate lots of discussions. So um, please do uh, chime in. If you have a discussion or if you have a question, you can either put it in the chat um, or raise your hand uh, to ask a question. Uh, yes, please, uh, Martin. Volume. Hi, Rick. Hey, Martin. Good to see you. So uh, this resonates with me. And what I love especially about your method is the fact that it has a, a wonderfully topsy-turvy uh, topology that seems to go against the notion of a geometer in the, in the root sense of geometry. And, and I was thinking specifically of Serre's The Origins of Geometry 
and connecting it to Poincaré's landmark essay from 1899, also entitled The Origins of Geometry, in which he demonstrates that all geometries are socially constructed and not essentialist. Yeah. Uh, very uh, important essay. And so what, what you seem to be setting against that kind of geometry, um, which also connects to Descartes and, and, and logocentrism and phallocentrism, um, is the notion of this undercurrent in, uh, in Spinoza. And I'm wondering, um, uh, connecting this undercurrent and the crack, whether you would make an, an analogous relationship to uh, imminence and the crack in relation to bifurcation. Uh, thank you, Marty. That's a good question. Um, uh, yeah, of course, as said uh, already, um, Serre is uh, very influential um, in my thinking. Uh, so his um, relation to Poincaré, I mean, he, he, he reads a lot of these uh, French materialists, uh, which, um, I mean, comes from a quite a, a much more mathematical perspective than uh, what we would um, uh, study today when we talk about materialism. <clears throat> Um, yeah, for me and what also for Ser uh, is, I think, very important is the way in which um, yeah, rigor uh, has become misinterpreted in a way in, in, in physics or in, in, the, in kind of geometry in that sense. Uh, also in the book, uh, the, the origin of the, the, the birth of physics, um, Sayer talks beautifully of uh, this, this very and more Greek uh, tradition of, uh, of, um, of physics and of dealing with the earth. Uh, so I'm much, uh, much more inclined to, to, to go to those um, publications to understand also our relation with the earth uh, uh, also referring a lot to um, I already mentioned him Lucretius and to the way in which uh, curving is actually the starting point for understanding change and our understanding how things evolve um, so yeah bifurcation um, um, I mean you're kind of Just interrupt for a second um, you can see from my other work that yeah. I'm connecting Prigogine's empirical project to imminence, irreversibility, and emergence, and tracing that all the way back to even before Spinoza. Uh, and, and so what this project, for, for my purposes, is a, a completely materialist approach to imminence. Uh, yeah. and, and, and so when you talk about the, uh, this kind of pervasive undercurrent, uh, 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 and, and then you, you talk about its relationship to the crack, that crack seems to be the point of instability, which points to surprise, which points to possible alternative futures and part of what wounds us is that we cannot depend upon stability in the face of cracks. So, so and, and so I'm wondering whether, whether this kind of thinking has, has uh, entered into your discourse yet. Uh, it's, in other words, uh, you're right about the critique of rigor. Um, uh, mm -hmm and particularly with the need to embrace statistical models of the world, uh, which has its own kind of rigor, of course, but is not precise causality, which is the inheritance of geometry. Uh, 
and and so that's that's the connection that I'm tr I'm trying to make. Um, and, and I'm I'm wondering whether you're willing to go there or, or or at least suggest that it does resonate with with your project. It does resonate with my project. Um, but yeah, for me, something like the crack is also. Uh, helpful in kind of understanding what is seen and what is not seen and the way in which kind of movement continues um, so it also has a lot of questions for humanity and for what we are able to see and what we cannot see um, so i try to open to that yeah, thanks rick great to hear you talk okay Okay, I, I also have a question. So I will ask uh, after you, can uh, Vera Bullman, okay? Yeah, good. You're welcome to go first. I can wait. Uh, but you raised your hands, I think, slightly before me. So let's, you know. <laughs> As you like. I, well, first, I really want to say how much I enjoyed your talk, Rick. Um, very beautiful, and I, I, uh, it, it resonates with so many things that I came across now in the in the in the recent time as well. And and there is a, a beautiful. So one thing that has profoundly troubled me in a way was that uh, Descartes, you know, his his architectonic model of the universe. With, re with respect to which he developed his analytical geometry, which means it's not really geometry, no, it's, it's, it's algebra. Yeah. But this model, he said, the, we need to think of the universe as a plenum with cracks. <laughs> you know, so it's very, so this kind of, of materialism of immanence that you are uh, putting to the foreground with the way that you work with Spinoza and Descartes, I think it's Perfect. It works <laughs> precisely in this way of, of uh, relating affectively to the earth without participating or falling into the danger of becoming fascistic while doing so, no? So th this is at the core of my interest in this Cersean Cer way of engaging with physics and mathematics, really. And, 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 and the past that you showed now, it, yeah, it was uh, for me very surprising and coming from totally different ends and seeming to crystallize around this, this, uh, this, this, uh, yeah, also the wound, the wound. I was looking for, a, you know, from psychoanalysis, the wound or the trauma is totally subjectivized. Yeah. But we need to think it objectively somehow. I wasn't familiar with the, the, the work that you referenced. Um, I, I immediately ordered the book. <laughs> what I was looking at was a, a scholar coming from psychoanalysis, but Elisabeth Bronfen, and she wrote about 20 years ago this book, which is The Knotted Subject. And then the knot kind of bypasses uh, you know, this, this uh, relation of the phallus and the symbolic in, in Lacan by, center, by centering the, the navel, the umbilical cord. And not the umbilical cord, the, the, the what is it called? The omphalos, no? So, so the, the belly button <laughs> as a kind of a of a of a of a, of a human of a, or a humanist, but in a in a in a in a very post-humanist and, and gendered yeah. and discourse. Uh, just to give you back some of the resonances that I picked up, it was I don't really have a question. I just wanted to. Yeah, well, thanks a lot. It's really interesting. Also, how you link it to to Descartes and uh, his role in architecture, of course. Uh, the, arch the 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 architect the Cartesian line is such a kind of a very odd, but so dominant way of uh, kind of um, doing architecture, also in modern times. Uh, so. And it's very un-Cartesian. Whatever we associate with Descartes it has very little to do with Descartes. This is so amazing. Yeah, yeah. No, that's also what I keep stressing, right? In, in, in somewhere in the book, I, I say, in the end, I guess no one agreed with Descartes because all these Cartesians, they come up with this new model, uh, kind of rethinking Descartes, and then the next one also comes up with a new model. But in the end, so this, so this is what became yeah. critical uh, analysis in many ways, uh, and I, uh, yeah, for me at least, is um, this material. Um, um, materialist approach is, is really something else. Uh, and that is also why people like Karen Barrett are critiquing critique. Um, because in the end, they critique the kind of Cartesianism that kind of continues to work with uh, pretty out of this world ideas uh, on um, 
points uh, and uh, and lines. Yep. Yep. And there, there is a, a really beautiful recent book by um, uh, James Griffith, mm -hmm. and it's on Descartes. On, from, from there, there I picked up this uh, this uh, this architectonic notion of the crack of the crack in the universe. <laughs> and he, what he did is he he threw the the role that imagination plays in Descartes with regard to his understanding of geometry. He um, interrogated Descartes according to the questions of pedagogy or didactics, and and he made a lot out of the relate. So he, his his point was that the imagination, which can analytically be methodically pursued by geometry, but it needs to be fabulating. So Descartes' own book on the world was written as a fable. Yeah. And, and he develops a really interesting um, kind of, a, yeah, a critique on models of pedagogy to which we subscribe today when we try to follow the methods that are critical. So it's a kind of a, yeah, I can't summarize now, but I'm, I'm this is a, a really nice reference. Yeah, it's interesting. If you can send it to me, I would like to take a look. Yeah. I will, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Andrea. Okay, that thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your talk. And uh, I want to make sure first that you hear me because uh, last time uh, on the previous seminar, I had some problem with the microphone. So just can you confirm that you understand? Yeah, yeah, yeah we hear you perfectly, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Okay, okay. Then my question is, uh, so you critiqued, uh, you criticized Descartes, uh, as I said, humanist perspective at the beginning of your talk. And uh, you said that you always prefer, prefer uh, or your starting point is uh, uh, Spinoza's position. But uh, so in that, um, with that in mind, I want to ask a question, how do you make, if you make a distinction at all between uh, human and non-human beings uh, from your uh, materialist uh, perspective? Uh, I guess, I, for example, I have in mind uh, Brandom's distinction between sapient and sap uh, sentience, but I guess that wouldn't be your kind of uh, way. Uh, yeah. So that's my first question, and uh, uh, the second question is just about the, the reference. Uh, where does uh, Negrestani talk about being opened by? Uh, that's all. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, the easy answer is to the to the last part is uh, it's in uh, uh, Cyclonopedia. Uh, uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. I refer to it pretty uh, often in in two parts of the book, so mm -hmm. it can be uh, easy to find. Um, your first part, the, the distinction between be in, in, in between human being and non-human being, something like that. Uh, yeah, the, yeah the, human the and non-human. No, I don't make this distinction. I, uh, uh, I, I stick to, um, to these principles uh, that I mm -hmm. started with uh, from Spinoza. So every individual uh, consists of a series of individuals at infinitum. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, a body, Spinoza talks of bodies, especially also in his, uh, the second part of the ethics. Uh, he, it's sometimes called the small physics of Spinoza. Spinoza didn't write a physics, which was really strange in his days, but there's a part in the ethics where he talks about figures and very much talk, I mean, he uses the word bodies. And yeah, yeah, and for him, a body is not necessarily organic, uh, not necessarily mm -hmm. uh, what you would call sentient. Um, it just means a way in, in kind of ways of connecting different entities. And this connection is the body and the connection is what perseveres in being. This is also a very Spinozist idea. Cool. Um, yeah. Yeah, so what perseveres in being is the body and what perseveres in being can be uh, partly organic and partly non-organic, for instance, my body, or, uh, but it can also include uh, many other um, um, individuals which are not necessarily always a part of my body. So it's, mm. yeah, so the kind of these oppositions between human and non-human or sentient and non-sentient 
I think they don't make any sense uh, from a Spinoza's perspective. Okay. In your yeah materialist world or or in your project you you don't make it okay that that's what I what I wanted uh, to know Th yeah. thank you for your answer and also important to add for so for Spinoza also it uh, there is no uh, um, distinction between thinking beings and non thinking beings as you see it in the card so there's a beautiful uh, letter which Spinoza wrote to. Uh, guy called Faller, uh, in which he explains that uh, a stone also thinks. Uh, and the way in which the stone thinks, it's not different from how an infant thinks. Yeah, and I know, I know that. I heard yeah. a lot about that position. Yeah. Okay. So, again, also that is not a way to make a distinction. Okay, anybody else want to jump in with a question? Yes, Aldo. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Rick. I uh, was just reading uh, your book. <laughs> so um, yeah, it's very interesting. Also, so the, the, your thoughts on cracks and wounds. I, so I, I work in medical ethics, so this is really <laughs> important for that. Uh, but so I was what I didn't quite understand was the idea of becoming a target. So maybe mm. you can a bit of elaborate on, on uh, a bit of explain uh, what you what you mean bit by this. So you you oppose it to Derrida's idea of uh, of uh, opening yeah. for someone else. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. I mentioned Derrida, and I could also talk about Edward Said, uh, who are kind of uh, uh, major figures uh, in European thought when it comes to thinking the other or thinking about otherness. Um, so my claim in the second part of the book is that in so their ways of thinking otherness very much coming from a phenomenological or hermeneutic perspective. And um, I guess uh, in a sense also uh, going back to... Uh, a more, uh, well, at least Hegelian uh, idea. But anyway, um, what they do is, uh, is they, um, yeah, I, I, I use De Cristani for that, but uh, I mean, this also in, in, in Deleuze's uh, logic of sense, this also plays an important role. Um, what they do is to, in, the, in, the, in the creation of otherness, the self plays a crucial role. Uh, as said, when Derrida talks about otherness, he says, I want to open up to the other, which means I open my door to the other. But then there's always this, this me who takes the initiative uh, on my conditions, on my way of understanding the world. Uh, so it seems extremely uh, hospitable but in the end it's very hostile i would say because it is about uh, it's kind of a colonialist attitude almost uh, of uh, of uh, kind of categorizing the world and um, um yeah making it hostile to your thoughts so the whole idea of uh, becoming a target is really about a radical openness of oneself also uh, for every possible um, form of anotherness. Anotherness uh, is a term that Deleuze uses in uh, logic of sense and it really it's, it, it's supposed to be very different from otherness because it is not in any way um, uh, identified or identifiable. Um, and, uh, and that is also what you kind of read in uh, Michel Tournier's work. Uh, it, it needs a lot of work from Robinson to finally understand uh, what the life of the island is all about and what the life of the island allows. It, it really um, asks a lot uh, to become a target in that sense. Um, and the idea of becoming a target in many ways is also 
what I work with in the in this other book, with which will come out soon, uh, uh, on the anti-fascist life. Uh, one of the best texts on on fascism is by Felix Guattari, uh, and especially the title there is fundamental. Uh, together with Antonin Negri, he, he did, that, did that. The title is "Everybody Wants to Be a Fascist," um, and the important moment is that you realize that and that fascism is not about or, be, or being anti-fascist it's not saying you are wrong and you are wrong but to understand the kind of fascism that is always already a part of you and to uh, uh, be willing to uh, to get rid of that or to be born anew in that sense so i guess becoming a target really kind of comes with this very um yeah uh, personal approach of trying to get rid of those beasts that are inside all of us. Right. Thanks. That, think, that's very, yeah, that's very helpful. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you. I'm taking over from uh, Professor Mojek. Uh, is there any other question? Uh, yeah. Uh, Hello. Hello. Hi, thank you, Rick, uh, for a very enjoyable talk. Um, I uh, I really appreciated, especially um, that you were talking about reading philosophy like as literature and literature as philosophy. This is something I always have found the most fruitful way in to doing this. And I also um, I liked what you said about surrealism uh, uh, and different ways of of using or reading surreal um, surrealist texts. And this is something at which I've also um, I've also found really useful using kind of using surrealism, especially in teaching creative writing, which is what I'm kind of been doing, using it as a modality for opening up ways of writing and thinking. Um, but my question was just something simple. Uh, you said at one point um, that uh, Japanese literature was particularly interesting for um, from a material materialist perspective. Um, and I was wondering if... Um, there were other writers uh, other than Murakami who who you were thinking about and why specifically what could you say more about that maybe um the reason why i yeah it's a really good question actually um uh, the reason why i think that there's so much interesting work being done uh, in post war japan is uh, again uh, following an idea of Michel Serre. So for someone like Deleuze and for many people of his generation, 1968 was kind of the, 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 the turning point, right? That's when they started realizing that uh, there's a different way of doing politics. There's a different way of dealing with, um, um, of uh, thinking about oneself and, uh, and the other. Uh, Michel Serre always said that for him, the turning point was really, uh, the bombing of Hiroshima, uh, so a little boy. Um, and why? Because he came from mathematics and, um, and physics. And up until that time, uh, mathematics and physics was just a good thing. I mean, you were kind of helping the world and things would improve after that. And of course, after, uh, after Hiroshima, that was actually, it was completely impossible to uh, think about the role of science um, in that way. So for Michel Serre, uh, that became the moment that he was confronted with um, the um, kind of the questions that philosophy was asking. Uh, and also kind of that had to be re rewritten in many ways, our relationship with the earth, our idea of nature uh, had to be rethought because of Hiroshima, because all of a sudden things were just completely mixed up in that sense. And I think that especially in Japanese literature, um, the, the whole idea of the atomic, for instance, uh, played such an important role and led to many beautiful um, books, Kenzaburi Oe. Uh, I'm completely mispronouncing things and I see that to Toshia Ueno is also part of <laughs> this session, so I'm afraid to pronounce this actually. Um, but um, Kenzaburi Oe, uh, as I with my bad Dutch accent would uh, would say it, is, is fantastic. 
And um, yeah, in 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 the book, I I make reference to quite a few uh, authors. Um, uh, also, the Book of Shadows is also fantastic, I think. Uh, uh, Black Rain. Sorry? Black Rain by Ibusi. Yeah. Yeah. We <laughs> I didn't refer to that. But uh, yeah, there's the... But I mean, the reason I think it's really that uh, uh, Japanese literature became so uh, vibrant uh, after the war uh, especially yeah in the post atomic age in that sense uh, also in terms of comics of course um, that uh, yeah gave a lot of uh, interesting literature thanks uh, okay uh, do we have a question from the panel. There's one in the chat. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, okay, from uh, uh, Rick from Dawood. A question on the statement, becoming a target, readiness to be born anew. Uh, when does a reborn start and stop? Or when it when is it completed? What will be thresholds. So is there constant change and total contingency or are there different states of stability? Uh, sorry for my bad pronouns. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, this has to do, of course, with uh, quite a few issues that I've already mentioned. Uh, nevertheless, this is a crucial point, of course. Uh, I mentioned Deleuze also talking about his non-carnal birth, and that would be 1968 for Deleuze. Uh, for Michel Serre, it would be 1945, the moment the bomb was dropped. Um, and I guess for all of us, uh, also the reason why we come up with conceptual personae is that we are searching for a way to kind of be reborn or uh, becoming a target and thus kind of taking up this other perspective, which allows us to see things that, that we haven't, hadn't seen before. So for me, the taking up the position of the geometer is, a, is very much about uh, becoming a target and searching for ways to see things that I didn't, didn't see before. And I guess uh, for the Legend Guattari, the whole idea of the conceptual persona is really kind of searching for ways to kind of take up a responsibility, which, um, uh, what didn't take up before. Uh, when I talk to Rosie Bradotti about this, she always says that my that her conceptual persona is the feminist because whatever topic she um, she discusses, it will all it's always kind of bringing her back to uh, being a feminist and what it means from a feminist perspective. Um, so this is also not something which is finished. I mean, Deleuze also didn't stop. Uh, uh, after anti oedipe uh, I mean, it was kind of something which was ongoing throughout his career. And I think that is also exactly what being wounded is all about. Being wounded is all about uh, finding a way to build a life on top of this wound, finding a way to keep on uh, staying with the trouble. If, Donna Her if we had Donna Haraway here, uh, keep on being um, understanding the kind of pain that is involved in it. Um, so I guess that is what uh, the woundedness, the kind of uh, the, the non-carnal birth or the being reborn is all about. Uh, kind of understanding and accepting and um, searching for ways to live this wound beautifully, to talk with um, Joël Bousquet. Yeah, Melissa was first, I oh, think. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, Melissa, then uh, uh, Denver. 
Hello. Um, thank you. That was um, a great talk and introduction to your book. And I resonate with huge amounts of it, what you've said. So it becomes difficult to ask a question um, other than that. I know there are a few areas that I have quest, um, where it's where I notice things. One of them is actually around feminism. Um, and perhaps the way into that is about this notion of the target and coming, uh, and it's an interesting word, target, um, because I feel that what you're talking about is, is, is actually something very, um, it's about becoming attuned to uh, the environment and to the, to the movement of change that, that happens and, and so, somehow trying to develop. And uh, uh, the way I think of it is almost musical, uh, you know, we're, we're trying to develop um, a rhythmic flow that allows us to stay with the change, stay with our wounds, to stay with what happens, uh, to let go, um, and to think about, uh, you. when well, you talk about how can we let, <laughs> how can we get rid of our fascistic tendencies and again we fall back into the the very thing we're trying not to do which is to push something away rather than to live with it mm -hmm. um but uh, I'm, I'm i'm actually writing not a novel as a thesis so um and i'm a psychotherapist so so these themes come up and the idea of integrating them all and i, I do have there's a phrase in, in that i use which is let's just go um, and that I don't, I don't know how we change, but sometimes we just, let's just stop <laughs> trying to find this and, and let it go. Um, but there's, um, but, but you're talking about living vulnerably, living with our wounds, um, holding our, our wounds in mind and in body and, and wearing them and being aware of them. And one of the things that I think we struggle with uh, is shame because I, I think generally speaking we are we feel a lot of shame around our wounds um, in our society and I, I wonder if that's come into your thinking of like well how, how do we do this because these are things we hide we hide them from our children we hide them from our parents we hide them from ourselves from our partners um, so that would be my question yeah very interesting and yeah Yeah, I would say that, I mean, this is this is really what, uh, what happens so often with wounds that people also search for, I mean, they want them to heal or they want them to disappear anyway. <clears throat> and uh, I guess that is what I really enjoyed uh, in the books of Murakami, that they do not heal. They will always return. And that is not a sad thing. That is just being honest. Uh, being honest, meaning, yes, we have these wounds and we search for ways to, uh, I mean, and, and I mean, sometimes they're not important, but uh, they come back uh, in many different ways. That's why the word trauma is actually literal. Uh, so it's Greek for the wound. So um, uh, it's something which keeps on returning in different ways, um, in different, um, in different uh, situations. Um, so taking this very seriously and understanding that uh, uh, how Busquet uh, phrases it, uh, that it is crucial for any life to take these wounds uh, seriously and to live your wounds beautifully actually is uh, I think uh, um, uh, such a um, such an insight also in uh, how we as writers but actually every person should somehow uh, search for a way to live uh, with one's wounds uh, so
So I think it's uh, it's kind of uh, the only way to to build up a life, to find a way to live with your wounds, which is also in a way deeply Spinozist, because Spinoza, as I started my talk, says that <clears throat> the mind is an idea of the body. So any kind of mind has to kind of always return to the, the different forms of woundedness and the states of these woundedness says, uh, when it's in, in every thought. Thank you. I'm interested in your uh, novel slash thesis, by the way, but so oh, keep me right. informed. <laughs> I'll write you about it. Yeah. I was wondering whether you could whether you could say a little bit about how you relate the lines of light with the becoming a target. They're quite interesting, I think, in the in the temperament, no? Maybe actually quite close, but but somehow also quite inverse, a bit like Spinoza and Descartes almost. <laughs> Yeah, so a line of flight is this concept from um, mainly Deleuze and Guattari, uh, their joint writings work with, and the line of flight for them is really uh, uh, kind of um, a way of searching for a, a, a deterritorialization, as they also call it, uh, and ideally a kind of a, an absolute deterritorialization, so a continuous moving away from um for instance a, uh, a humanist perspective how does that relate to um to uh becoming a target i guess this becoming a target is not um a uh, a once in a lifetime thing it's a continuous search for becoming a target and so I guess it would be the same as, uh, so becoming a target would be the same as a deterritorialization. Uh, because Deleuze and Guattari make this uh, difference between an absolute and a relative deterritorialization. And a relative deterritorialization means that uh, you move from one place to another and you're encapsulated in whatever kinds of. Um, um, presence again yeah. um, and the goal for the Legend Guattari and they also give other names to it in um, a thousand plateaus they also talk of uh, how to become a body without organs uh, it's a it's more or less the same ethical move that they ask from you um, what I like about becoming a target is that it is really such a kind of a a response to this uh, discussion on otherness and becoming a target, especially if it's a permanent um, development, it um, it really kind of allows you to, uh, uh, to 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 take up this permanent line of flight or uh, absolute deterritorialization or continuous um, questioning of. Uh, of any kind of um, um, organization that you are uh, captured by. Mm -hmm. So in a way, to give a simple answer, I, I think that becoming a target, at least I hope that it is a kind of a, an ongoing thing. And that means that it would be quite similar to what the line of flight or what a, an absolute deterritorialization would do. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Willem is, uh, yeah. Yeah. Can you hear me, Rick? Yes. Yeah. First of all, thank you for your, uh, your lecture. Uh, I've studied in your book for a little thing and uh, I have a question for you. In your image of uh, geophilosophy, in your book, you mention uh, philosophers and artists as geometers. 
So they become a target, take up responsibility, and they see a new perspective, 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 uh, and they're realizing uh, that their wounds are eternal, uh, kind of shadows eh, for their lives. Now is my uh, point. Do you see this also as an uh, ethical call for all people? So yes. okay, nor normally we, we uh, have uh, the science, the arts and the ethics. And um, you can say that uh, they are uh, communicated barrels. And, and, uh, I, I read that in your work. So the ethical point in your book is not alone, uh, in my opinion, for uh, philosophers and artists. How, how do you see that? Um, yeah. Mm. So when I start from Spinoza, I highlight, uh, instead of um, rational thought or whatever idea of thinking that you can find in, for instance, Descartes, but also with other philosophers, I like the idea of imagination with Spinoza because it is such a kind of a first drive, kind of um, can go in so many directions. Um, and I think this is, um, as I said also in this talk, actually, uh, this is really where art and philosophy meet. It's not so much uh, the end product, of course, because we produce different things. Uh, the philosophers produce a thought and artists uh, would actually uh, create an artwork or a thing in, in, in real in some ways. Uh, but it's kind of the, the first drive, which is interesting, I think. Uh, so to start from imagination. Uh, and yes, I hope that we all have uh, uh, both an artist and a philosopher inside of us. Um, so, uh, yes, uh, I hope it's um, something that um, everyone um, in the world takes up. <laughs> now, if, yeah. you can, if you can realize that, uh, yeah, what in the French say, the attitude, uh, attitude uh, dogmatique. Yeah. Uh, and the attitude, attitude, uh, attitude dogmatique vécu. Eh? Uh, dus in, in, this, in that sense, I, I think that... Um, uh, your your story, your your call, is in in in, 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 in that sense can be uh, an attitude dogmatique also. So um, it's it's very very important uh, to to realize uh, where it, um, George Agamben uh, in his Homo Sager uh, series has it uh, uh, about the exclusion, and uh, he he says uh, we live in an era of uh, uh, yeah, how do you say how do you say that um, the concentration camps? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I've read something from Sarah, and uh, this is the real point that uh, the 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 bomb has changed his mind uh, and uh, his ambition as a scientist. Yeah, he is now uh, a philosopher. Uh, if, a philosopher of um, how do you say that uh, to see the future in a new in a new kind of perspective, mm -hmm. and so um, yeah, I, I don't I don't know uh, if I get my point right, but in in that sense, um, if we uh, think uh, or will think of promote that philosophers, sex philosophers, and artists. Um, can see uh, the new uh, the new thing. Uh, th yeah, that's something. Uh, uh, what 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 is reasonable? But mm. I think we have to think beyond that, also. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's not so much that I'm only addressing this to philosophers or artists, but it's I'm interested in what philosophers do and in what artists do, mm -hmm. which is obvious in the book because I quote a lot of philosophers and I quote a lot of artists yeah. and writers. Uh, and I th think, yeah, so it's, it's more like 
the kind of attitude that I want uh, to highlight. Uh, so philosophers and artists start from the imagination, yes. and take that very seriously. And um, well, I can at least hope that uh, many people take the philosopher and the artist inside of themselves very seriously and uh, take imagination in that sense more seriously. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, do we have a question from the panel? Uh, yeah. Martin. Uh, Rick, I just wanted to add one more thing, uh, particularly with re reference to art. Um, you know, I've been um, interested in music lately and sound and lately, yeah, lately. Um, so um, uh, the notion there's some um, guitars here, Martin. You can yeah. Well, that's what inspired. Yes, yeah, so, yeah. And and I was actually hoping that you'd uh, take one off the wall and uh, and 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 entertain us a little bit, but. Um, uh, the notion that I have of a gift of silence requires jazz musicians to relinquish control first by uh, deciding not to play. That in that gift of silence, they must enter into a form of very fast cognition which requires them to react viscerally to what's going on around them. That's the deepest level of improvisation, which requires the following dictum, um, um, freedom of thought requires freedom from thought as an initial condition. And it seems to me that that resonates quite nicely with the sense of openness that implies the restructuring of, of cognition and intellectual activity uh, 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 upon our wounds. That, 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 there's, that there's a really interesting kind of resonance there. And I, I, uh, I would uh, 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 suggest that uh, maybe you might be able to bring music in very specific ways into this formulation and i mean it's a beautiful thought martin so uh, i um, and uh, i think it uh, has a lot to do uh, yes with uh, uh, kind of understanding uh, oneself uh, in many ways <laughs> to shut up as a musician yeah, to, to not to not play yeah literally yeah yeah <laughs> Because when you don't, you're superimposing order onto everyone else. Yeah. Sorry, I'm kind of, my computer makes noises. Um, yes, um, I don't have too much to add because, I mean, you, I think you, you make a good point there. Uh, Understanding one's own position and to search for ways not to intervene is is of course crucial. So, um, yeah, thanks for that. Okay, we have a question from the panel. There's one in the chat again, please. Oh, oh. Uh, thank you, Iris. It is the hour's question. Uh, it's this one. Uh, one more question. If leading a beautiful life is the horizon of the constant transformations, could you then please elaborate what beauty means? Th that's you. the last one. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Uh, well, <laughs> a, a tiny question uh, to end up with. Uh, what beauty means. 
Uh, this is a reference to um, Joël Bousquet. Um, uh, I mean, I have to do this quickly, of course, because it's it's uh, it's actually a huge thing. But it's really what Bousquet is is interested in is an aesthetics. He's setting up an aesthetics as uh, not so much as uh, just thinking about uh, beautiful artworks, but uh, almost in a Foucauldian way, kind of. Um, an aesthetics of the self, giving form to one's own life. Uh, that was what he was working on uh, throughout his uh, life uh, after being wounded, giving form to himself as a writer, as a thinker, as uh, someone who um, 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 played a crucial role in surrealism. Uh, and again, and also coming back to what... Uh, what uh, what uh, Helen also uh, referred to, surrealism is uh, is really such an important art form. Also during the war, right during fascism, while fascism was going on, surrealists uh, came up with beautiful alternatives for a completely cracked up world. Um, uh, and, and someone like Joël Bousquet is in that sense uh, a perfect aesthetic because he gives form to his own life, closing the curtains, um, uh, but building up something beautiful inside. Um, and I guess that's a, an important uh, lesson to learn of how to live a life um, in many ways. So that is, I think, how he would uh, refer to it. Uh, thank you, Rick. Uh, let me see. Okay, if there is no other questions, uh, I wanna uh, on uh, another note, uh, just two uh, things from the live chat to compliment, like uh, from uh, Shiva Zarabadi. Uh, thank you, Rick. I really enjoyed your talk, especially the part of Sirius and he becoming with River Garon where he was growing up. The other comment is from uh, Teya Randala. Thank you for your brilliant book. Uh, uh, it contributes to so many ways and helped to see uh, Murakami's book differently again. That is from the live chat. Uh, if there is nothing else, I want to thank Rick for participating in uh, January Open, uh, SMR Open seminars. Uh, thank you everybody for joining and with, uh, for the beautiful discussion and the beautiful talk, Rick. Uh, see you next time. Thank you. Thank you very much.